So when we talk about the topic of transparency, uh, we often hear from practitioners, uh, from the advertiser side, the agency side, uh, or the uh, publisher side. Uh, but our first speaker, Doug Wood, brings uh, quite a different perspective uh, to that. Uh, he is a partner, as I mentioned, at, at Reed Smith, uh, but also acts as general counsel for the ANA, uh, for the Mobile Marketing Association, and for the Advertising Council. Uh, he's been described as the renaissance man of media advertising and law, uh, and he comes with 40 years experience uh, in the sector. So uh, without further ado, Doug, please join us. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, if you don't mind, I kind of walk around so it's a little more comfortable for me and, and can see the audience a little bit better. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the title is, is the media transparency, transparency debate over. So. So let's get right into it, because I have 15 minutes to set this up for the panel, and we'll see where we, we go from there. So what are we seeing in the marketplace? Or what are we seeing in the last uh, two years? I call it Transparency 2.0, because it was two years ago that the K2 intelligence report was first published. And that was one year after John Mandel had his epiphany on a stage in Hollywood, Florida, where he made all these accusations that sort of created this turmoil. But in many ways, transparency and the issues that surround transparency have been around a long time. Rebates, rebates weren't a new thing. They had been discussed for many, many years before that, so we could probably call this Transparency 10.0. But it really didn't hit the fan in a big way until two years ago when K2 Intelligence came out with its report. So what have we seen? What are the sort of the, the, the key elements in this transparency debate uh, that uh, we've, we're asking ourselves whether it still is continuing? The one is the non-transparent media. You know, that's a big part of the evaluation on where is the non-transparent media? Is it legitimately non-transparent? The expression was, they'll be transparent about being non-transparent, was one of the buzzwords that was said some time ago. That didn't sit well with some brands, and so that debate came over. What is a legitimately non-transparent media? Conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, recently, I'm aware of, a, of a, a large global brand who asked one of the large global agencies to give them a corporate tree of how many subsidiaries and affiliates they had. Uh, they given a corporate tree, and it had a reasonable number. The brand was a little suspicious, so they did their own evaluation, and they came up with a report that said this particular holding company had over 600 subsidiaries and affiliates around the world. Now, it's not that they were trying to not represent what they were, but it depends on the picture. And, and that, that really creates this conflict of interest thing that still arguably is an issue. Rebates and incentives. We saw that when this first came out in 2016, that there was a pretty much a denial uh, that the rebates and incentives were prevalent, particularly in the United States. And, and, and we've seen in, in the many contracts and transactions that we've done uh, on behalf of ANA members over the last two years, that in fact, you know, that there is a lot more transparency on some of these things in some jurisdictions and not so much in others. So that looked like that was real progress being made uh, on the rebates and incentives issue until last week when McKinsey issued a report at the, at the financial management conference in, in Hollywood, Florida from the same stage that John Mandel had his epiphany three years earlier that said they still are there. And that these rebates and incentives in programmatic are as high as 35% according to McKinsey and in traditional media hover around the 5% rate. I don't know what rate is or is not acceptable. That's not for, for me and my role to, to determined, but simultaneously with the McKinsey report, it was kind of interesting that both Adweek and AdAge came out with articles the very same day that talked about the reality or non-reality of, of rebates and incentives in, in the global markets, including the United States. That created a whole new furor. And the question remains, and I, I don't have the answer to it, whether or not that has reignited that fire. And we're going to see. I, I, you know, I think we have to watch very closely how the market reacts to this McKinsey report. Uh, McKinsey claimed that it had surveyed many, many executives. It, it, it talked about a claim that there were 500, at least 500 reviews of uh, contracts and accounts in the last two years, that there have been many turnovers. Uh, someone asked the question, well, how, why is it no one's been fired over, over uh, uh, transparency issues? And, and it's true, no one's been, that I know of, that has officially been fired necessarily over transparency issues, but there's been a lot of change in the marketplace. And that McKinsey report that was not commissioned by the ANA, it was not commissioned by the forays, it was an independent study that was done by McKinsey, has really created a furor. There were brands at that, at that uh, conference that talked about, this is a new beginning, we have to start looking at this again. There were agency executives who I know, and I respect a great deal, who thought it was reprehensible. So that, so that butting of heads is going to possibly happen again on rebates and incentives. Audits, we're seeing more progress in audits, so that's been a, a good thing. 
Uh, there obviously are legitimate limits to audits that ought to be negotiated and understood. Uh, you know, this industry, uh, from, the brand, from the agency side, uh, you know, has, been, uh, has had a pretty open kimono all too often. I mean, if I were ever asked in my practice to give the transparency that agencies are asked to give, I'd say, no, thank you. I don't need you as a client. Now, luckily, the law profession hasn't had the, the issues that you folks have had, so we, we can get away with that. The agency business has sort of opened its kimono as a business more than just about any industry I know, and I've been doing this for 40 years, representing people in this sector. And then data, the, 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 the holy grail of data. Who's going to own it? Who's going to monetize it? How are you going to manage it? That's a big part of this transparency issue as well. So is the debate over about this part of it? Maybe, maybe not. What I suggest is that we're going beyond media transparency now, and we're going into what I would call trust 1.0. Because in the end of the day, this is all about trust. That's really what this is a relationship management issue. It's not so much about transparency, media transparency alone. And this trust permeates a lot of areas. And it's not just trust between the agencies and the brands. That's obviously a core issue. But it's also trust between the publishers and the brands. Because there is a big disconnect there. And data is a really good example of where that disconnect occurs. And ultimately, it's the trust between the, the brands and the consumers that needs to be restored because consumers, they've always been distrustful. We all know that. The advertising business, you know, it's always been, been a matter of trying to capture the trust of consumers. But now consumers are far more empowered than they ever were before. So that trust factor is all the more difficult uh, to achieve with consumers. So what are the things that are interfering with trust 1.0 and, and achieving the trust levels that we want? I think it's denial, delay, and disguise. And those are three things that are happening in the marketplace today. And I'll give some quick examples of each one in various areas. The first is, is denial. You know, you, the cheating uh, spouse here is a, a brother, relatively provocative uh, uh, analogy, but it nonetheless is, is important to put into context. This is not the first time that trust has been challenged in the advertising brand relationship, the agency brand relationship. Back in the 80s, when the Brits came to the United States and started buying agencies at alarming multiples as far as the brand community was concerned, there was this cacophony of, oh my god, these people are walking away with millions of dollars. Bob Jacoby retired and clipped coupons in, in, in Florida and, and was a you know, multimillionaire on the, on the money that, uh, that his brands had paid him over the years at Ted Bates. There was nothing that wasn't transparent about that, though. I mean, you couldn't hide what your agency was being sold for. And everybody knew it was a 15%, 17 6%, 5% model. So for advertisers who were so outraged at, that, at those economics, they were pretty ignorant because they could have seen exactly what was going on at the time. So it was transparent. So ultimately, trust came back. Now, it obviously marked the beginning of the end of the commission structure, and, and agencies started to get much uh, tighter margins that they had to deal with and had much more difficulty in getting the ROI that their shareholders want. But they figured it out. And they figured it out and maintained that trust and rebuilt that trust. That happened again in the 90s when we had a, a number of recessions and we saw agencies going out of business, we saw brands going out of business. And in, during that process, media was not paid. So media then turned to whoever was survived, whether it was the agency or the advertiser, and said, pay us. Now, if the advertiser had already paid the agency, the advertiser ended up paying twice because they had to double pay because the media never got the money from the agency. And similarly, if the agency had not been paid by the advertiser and the advertiser went bankrupt, the media was really leveraging the agency saying, you're going to pay us, otherwise we're not going to take any advertising for any of your clients. So trust eroded again. And we saw all sorts of complicated transactions with escrow payments and trust accounts and all sorts of things that, just, that, that were, were allegedly substitutes for trust. But luckily, and over time, the economy got better and those kinds of agreements are rare and few and far between nowadays. So the trust was restored. The real question here is whether this trust this time can be restored. And I think that it, it really comes down to no longer the denial that there is a problem. That's the first step. And that's been said by people like Bob Leodis and Mark Pritchard and others. Speaking of Pritchard, the other thing is delay. Pritchard uh, has said any number of times, as has uh, have other major CMOs, that the brands <laughs> are going to take back control. That is their perception that they have ceded control to the supply chain. They're taking back control. They, they say they want to take back control. That's easier said than done. We've seen this before, haven't we? This is after the deja vu thing. How many times have we heard that brands are going to take things in-house? They're going to take their entire agency in-house. They're going to take their media buying in-house. Now they're going to take programmatic in-house. That's a nice concept for, for a few brands, but it's an impossibility for most. So the only way it's going to work is in this partnership. Uh, that ultimately needs to work in the marketplace. And the delaying of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this control balance that the brands are looking for through cooperation by the supply chain is not doing anybody any good. 
Then you have disguise. Uh, the latest disguise, and, and uh, some people will debate this, are so-called value pots. Value pots are, are uh, free media, essentially, that an agency can extract from media for upfront guarantees before they've technically been paid for those, those media buys by the advertiser. Now, there's one school of thought that says that's just a rebate like any other rebate that should be fully disclosed to, to the advertiser and, and the advertiser that is entitled to a proportionate share. Or there's another school of thought that says, no, wait, the agency is taking a risk in doing that because they don't have a guarantee they're necessarily going to get the money from the advertiser. So it's their risk. It's their inventory. It's theirs to use and sell and resell and do what they want to do in the marketplace. But again, it's not that a value pot is or is not something that is appropriate in the business community, it's whether it's transparent. And without that transparency, the trust is eroded. So you're going to see in a, in a revision to the ISBA contract that is going to be a revision to the last revision they put out a few weeks ago, they're going to revise their section on value pots to make them more transparent. The ANA is going to similarly do that with its next iteration of the standard contract. So, so the, the, but there's disguise in many other areas too. It's not just disguise in media buying. We see disguise in bots. We see disguise in, in measurement. We just disguises with walled gardens. We just decide, you see disguises all throughout the industry. And working together, the only people that are gonna solve that are, is a teamwork between the advertiser and the agency that is, is sorely in trouble today. So what do we think the future is going to hold here? This is all about that, again, the, the, the denial, the delay, and the disguise. MSAs, Master Services Agreements, are, are in the process. A lot of them are being renegotiated. One of, the, one of the realities is that when 2016 happened and the K2 report came out, a lot of contracts were in the middle of their terms. And as we move forward, now two years down the road, a lot are coming to their renewal point. So we're seeing an entirely different approach to MSAs and pitches and awards in, in, in competitions with RFPs. It's much more of a, 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 a mandate that the contract be a part, an integral part of being awarded the contract. Data ownership and monetization, obviously the, the most valuable thing we have in the marketplace today is data. And we have to find a way to share that data among the constituent parts of the community so that they can all have their fair share of the potential for what they bring to the table. It was interesting to see today some of the, 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 the speeches this morning about, about artificial intelligence and, and all the rest of it. And I wonder whether or not the consumer, you know, this partnership we have with consumers, is going to be so comfortable with being replaced, even though you're being told you're not going to be replaced. We've heard all about technology in the past that has you know, made things easier for, for this new endangered species we have here on Earth. And, and the question is whether or not we really, uh, it, you can duplicate that historical anomaly or not. Uh, so that ownership is really important, and it's a big part of what negotiations will be going on. The GDPR, which we'll talk about on another panel as well, and walled gardens. You know, the, we've seen what Facebook and, and Google are saying about the GDPR and what they're instituting about the GDPR. There are some who feel that that's a good thing because they're helping the industry protect uh, against these so-called so draconian fines and all these problems with GDPR. On the other hand, there's a school of thought that says they are actually building higher walls. And they're using that as an excuse to control more of that data. If you think of a, as a brand, it's difficult to deal with an oligopoly of six major holding companies buying 85% of the media. Try dealing with a duopoly that controls 85% of all the spend you have, period. And they're controlling the data. There's an expression in, a, in an ad in the United States called post and pray, which in the end of the day may be what you're going to end up with if these walled gardens get too high and the transparency uh, isn't allowed. They, walk the, they talk the talk. I mean, I, I've heard them talk the talk about transparency, but I won't make any friends here from Google and Facebook to say, I don't think you're walking the walk. I think we're getting a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Get some, but not enough. And there's a real, real mixed message now with GDPR. Viewability, measurability, ad fraud, we're going to talk about that in a few seconds. Uh, huge issues that are coming out in the beginning. And it, it's all about who's going to pay for what and who's going to have the responsibility for what. It's not, it's not necessarily fair for an advertiser to look at an agency and say, this is all your, your fault, your problem, you deal with it. And it's, similarly, it's not fair for the agency to look back to the advertiser and say, well, you know, we, we can't do anything about this because we don't control so much of this infrastructure. That, that is a shared responsibility. And ultimately, what we hope to see, you know, moving forward is more of a sharing of that responsibility than sort of the you and us kind of thing that we're seeing. And lastly, brand safety. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, huge issue, it, it, you know, we'll get into more detail about it, but that's, uh, that's obviously the future. Now what you're seeing here is more things of major importance on this list than I've ever seen in the 40 years I've practiced advertising law. And my, my, the fear that many of us have is a fatigue fear. 
that out of fatigue, the two most important constituent players in this market, the agencies and the brands, will just get fatigued. And they'll say, okay, Google, Facebook, do what you gotta do. Okay, MarTech, do what you gotta do. Just, you know, leave us alone. You know, we, we just got too many things we have to deal with. That would be a huge mistake, a huge mistake, if that were to occur. Because then, then it really is the tail wagging the dog. So that's part of Mark Pritchard's thing of taking back control. I think it's brands have to take back control. He would agree with that. I also think together with the agencies that they really need to be uh, taking control. To quote one of our panelists to sum this up, you know, Nick Manning, I asked him, you know, what, what is your sort of conclusion to this trust 1.0 kind of idea? And he said that ultimately trust can only be achieved through transparency, tying the two together again. And brand marketers need to know that their partners have their backs on all of this, including media buying, viewability, invalid traffic, ad fraud, and brand safety. It's the complete panoply. So it's more than just trust. It's being responsible and accountable and not turning a blind eye to invisible ads, bots, and jihadi videos. I mean, I couldn't have said it any better. That's really that, that issue that we have as an industry now. And so we started with Transparency 2.0. Uh, and we were kind of sick of that one. I and mean, we've been living and breathing that and hearing it ad nauseum, unfortunately, because of McKinsey, we're gonna keep hearing it more. Uh, but we'll live through it somehow, some way we'll live through it, because historically we have. And then we've gone on to trust you know, 1.0, which is the new sort of theory I'm suggesting is that really we have to reestablish trust between one another. And ultimately, if that can happen, then we'll return to that partnership that I've seen so many times in 40 years create some of the most incredible content, the most incredible delivery, the most incredible service to consumers than anywhere in the world, in the United States. I haven't seen what's happened in Europe, but I'm sure it's just as good here. And God knows what's happening in China, who's a whole other worry that we have to sort of talk about sooner or later. But that's kind of where we are today. That's the quick update. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the, to the MC. Thank you. Just wait two seconds. You wait, wait two seconds. Picture time. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, what did you want to be when you were a small, it cannot be lawyer? <laughs> well, as I said, I grew up in Hawaii. Mm. Uh, and uh, probably wanted to be a surfer. And just a beach bum. And some people say I'm a bum, but uh, there's no beach. But you can still make it. I think you can still oh, make it. It's time. It's, it's time. Are you telling me it's time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any questions? Besides what you wanted to be when you were a little bit careful when you ask a lawyer a question. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We'll hunt you down so afterwards. Peter, I know you have a question. Oh, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, to the debate now, so I can't wait for it. You cannot <laughs> wait for it. Any questions, guys? I have a question for you because uh -huh. I both worked on the agency side and I worked on the client side and I worked in the publisher side. And you said about the connection between the, that it cannot be one ownership, that it either have to be like, you have to work together. And I think that a lot of, I don't know, but I see a lot of people struggle with like the responsibility of an agency and the agency to find their position. Do you have any good advice? Like what is the first thing we should do and f try to fix in that relationship? and if you're an agency, right, it's... Um... And ultimately, um, the right direction began shortly after the K2 intelligence report where the 4As and the ANA got into a room and tried to talk about this, the way they had always talked about problems for so many years. Somewhere along that spectrum, the trust was lost and the 4As walked out or the ANA walked out. It depends on who you talk to who walked out of the room. That is not any way to solve this issue. So that's why we, we, when we see a report from McKinsey that is done independently of the two most important players in this, in this spectrum, and one describes it as reprehensible and the other describes it as a new light and a new burning of this fire, again, rekindling of the fire, if they don't get back together again, yeah. it, it's just not gonna work. It's not gonna work and it never has worked without that partnership. I don't mean it's being nostalgic, you know, but, but that's really, having been in this business a long time, that is so sorely missing today. But maybe you and I, we can make a new report then. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. Just one quick question, just to follow up on that. There's, um, in your view, is there any vested interest in the consultancies triggering this debate? Can you <laughs> just wait two seconds? Okay. Who's yeah, two, two, two seconds, because I think uh, they cannot hear. That's a, that's a very Doc, loaded uh, question. Can you just, two seconds, can you so, just repeat so hi, people... Hi, my name's uh, Katie. I'm, uh, I work at, at Clear Channel International. Um, and. Uh, uh, just uh, my question was, you know, given that, that last answer, obviously McKinsey, do you think they have a, a view or do any of the consultancies have a, have a view in, in raising this issue of, of transparency up the, uh, up the agenda? 
I would not be surprised if that were the case. But the bigger issue to me is that if the two historical constituent players don't get their act together, then Accenture and Deloitte and, and, K, and EY and, and, and McKinsey, and they're all coming in now. They're already there. Now, that may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not going to be around long enough to see whether the, you know, how that, all that dust settles. But it's not, it's not a healthy environment for the, for the two parts of this industry that have built to where it is today. And, and I think that's, you know, it could be that McKinsey did this because well, they didn't do it out of, the, you know, out of the kindness of their heart. They obviously did it because they see it as an opportunity, as do others. Do we have one more question? I don't know if I'm allowed to so you're from Accenture or something, now somebody's going to throw the tomato at me? Oh, yeah, that's true. Do we want, really want to hear? Okay, fair enough. You, you can no, I, was, I wasn't sure what the appropriate question, but what do you think about the promise of blockchain technology to fix trust? <laughs> okay, that's a long question. So they will take it outside, and everybody who want to join that. <laughs> Sorry. Did can, you want me to try to answer that? Yeah, can you do it in, sure. in, in 30 is, seconds? Blockchain, if you listen to folks, is apparently the penicillin for all ills, <laughs> and it's not going to work because everybody in the chain has to cooperate. So it's, it's going to come in some fashion, but it's going to be time. I, I can't imagine that's going to be any time soon. Last question before we move. I think one thing that's changed in the paradigm as before it was an art and science conversation. There were relationships. There were things we just didn't know. Now with measurement, which we're going to talk about now, as an advertiser, I work for PNG, we can measure everything. So why do I need an agency for tracking, reporting, understanding if I can do it myself? So if we're trying to reset the paradigm, where should we go look for that value now? Because before, while relationships are still important, they don't feel as important as they used to be. How do we think about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that, that with all relationships, I've been married 45 years. I have a different relationship with my wife today than I did when I first got married. It evolves because we change and we figure out a way to make the change and cope with the change. The brands and the agencies need to cope with that change. There, there are certain roles, like AI, take AI for example, that are going to eliminate the need for certain human intervention and thinking. On the other hand, there are, are, are human interplay in all of those things that are really important to hear original ideas, to hear different perspectives, and to have a, you know, more of an open relationship in that respect. So it should evolve. I, I, again, I don't think that either on the brand side or the agency side, thinking that that can be replaced as a fundamental relationship is a, is a sensible way to look at it. Because it, it hasn't worked for millennium. From the first you know, elixir that was sold out the back of a wagon, there was a, a relationship that was built you know, between the, the brand and agencies and the consumers. So I, I worry that, that there's too many people, whether it's blockchain or AI or whatever else, you know, technology. I worry about that. So before you retire and start surfing in your next career, we're going to have a panel. <laughs>